<laughs> Whoa, somebody's been sleeping in my bed. Who's been using my pulpit? There. Someone's been eating my porridge. All right, well, good evening. We have all kinds of first world problems. Thank you, brother, for that. That, that, uh, that was a blessing, and uh, uh, I'm glad we have such gifted musicians and singers this morning. Uh, the, the, the music and the worship in both services were just, I say, off the chart. And, uh, and so it's good to have gifted musicians. And by the way, he does all that without music. He does all that by ear. And so that's, that's pretty, pretty cool too. Well, tonight I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the coolest part of all, God's Word, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And um, tonight we are talking about a new covenant, a new covenant. When the doctor said to me, it's a boy, my life changed forever. I was already a father of a beautiful little girl by the name of Lauren, but I had in my mind kind of relegated the lion's share of responsibility in raising her uh, to my wife Beth, and I was wrong in that I now understand the unbelievable impact a dad has on his daughters. But back then I was young and I was dumb. And it took a son who I was expecting to be another daughter to wake me up to my responsibilities as a dad. And um, because I knew he would want to be just like me. Lord help him. My point is this, many times what we think about something isn't really true. We need a paradigm shift. And tonight, I I want us to have that paradigm shift with something even more important. And it's the eternal concept of law and grace. Because sometimes we can embrace grace, but still live in law. Like uh, many people, um, I believe sometimes we misunderstand grace and um, our grace is no more than warmed over legalism and I want to give you um, one thought about that we call them takeaways here and then I want to try and build on it and here's our takeaway for tonight God's grace is not a divine commodity for me to dispense to others it is a personal reality that overwhelms me and changes me for all to see. Now think about those words. In other words, just like a birthmark that you receive when you're born, you can't hide grace marks in your life. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, He said, see your good work. People will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, that's my prayer, is that people will see our good works and that they'll see the reality of our faith. Now, I want you to look with the passage with me in 2 Corinthians 3, and beginning in verse 1, we're going to look at three verses. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, Paul asks? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You see, in the days of Paul, teachers would carry around their credentials with them. They would carry around letters that said that they were who they, were, who they claimed to be and that they were qualified to teach. And the Corinthians, Paul said, were his letters of recommendation. 
He, in other words, he, he said people can look at the lives that are being changed in the ministry and see that it was a legitimate ministry. Now, notice verse 4 and 5 here. Because people realized that a change had come over these people. They could look and see. They had turned from idols and worshiping idols to worshiping Jesus Christ. And it was undeniable. And Paul says in verse 4, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is in God. See, Paul wasn't taking personal credit with that. Paul's adversaries, and he had a lot of adversaries, were focusing on his humanity and saying, well, there's no way that this guy is an apostle. First of all, he's a Roman citizen. Paul was not focusing on his humanity. He was focusing on God's divinity. And see, that's the first step of understanding grace. Paul's like, look, hey, my sufficiency is in God. I don't need your approval. If you open your eyes, the proof is right there in front of you. And it's in these Corinthian believers. It's in these people to whom I'm ministering the gospel. The problem is, is when people are looking for the proof in us, sometimes they don't see a difference in us and the world. And the difference of which I speak has nothing to do with our physical makeup. It has to do with our spiritual makeup and the way we respond. Listen, if, if that's all we have as proof of who we are is our words, then that's not enough. The proof that impacts is not physical it's spiritual. A life that has been broken by grace, overwhelmed by God's love, and saturated to the point of undeniability of Christ's likeness is one that people can't hide from. It's authentic. You know, if I were to go up into the bad industry full of water and, um, and jump in it and come walking down here, I wouldn't have to tell you that I was wet. You could see that I was wet. You could hear that I was wet. I would be sloshing around. But I can tell you right now that I'm soaking wet, but you don't hear the sloshing. You see, those are just words. It's not a reality. And that's the thing. When people look at our lives, they should, they should hear grace sloshing around when we walk around. Now that Paul has established his own credentials in Christ, he launches a focus on ministry itself here. And he goes straight for the hinge pin of ministry. The difference between law and grace. The contrast between the old covenant, which was law, and the new covenant, which is the gospel. Now, a covenant is simply a promise. That's all it is. It's an agreement between two parties. And in this case, God and mankind. The Old Covenant was a legal system. It was delivered, if you remember, by God to the uh, Israelites, to Moses specifically. You remember they were out in the wilderness and Moses went up on Sinai and God gave him the law and these tablets and he came down. And under the law, the Old Covenant, blessings were conditional. God's blessing depended upon obedience. It was a covenant of works. The people did what God said, and God blessed them. But it was all about works. God would do his part, but you had to do your part. But because it depended on man performing good works, it couldn't produce righteousness. Because right, we, we are unrighteous. And so there was a problem there. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But here comes a new, a new covenant, which is the gospel of grace. And under it, God covenants to bless man freely by his grace through the redemption that is found in Jesus Christ. Everything under the new covenant depends on God, not me, not mankind. And so it can, it can succeed. Therefore, the new covenant is able to accomplish what the old covenant could never, ever accomplish. Now look again at verse 6. He says, Who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, 
but of the Spirit. You see, he's drawing a difference between the law, the old covenant, and the new covenant. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So those people who were criticizing Paul were known as Judaizers. You see, Judaizers, they did something kind of unique. They had a hodgepodge. They would, they would mix the law and grace together. They taught Christians that they must observe certain portions of the law of Moses in order to be fully accepted by God. And so the apostles here uh, are going to demonstrate their superiority by how much they know the law. Now look at verse 6 again. Paul says, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So what does he mean? Well, this means that if you just take the outward the little literal words of the scripture and try to be obedient to the letter without desiring to be obedient to the full spirit of the passage, then it harms you rather than helps you. Let me give you an example. If you look at Hebrews 10.25, Hebrews 10.25 says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but come together, encourage one another, it says. So, if you, by being here tonight, you are satisfying the letter of the law, so to speak. You're not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. You're here. But what about the spirit of the law? Because 1 John 4, 7, 8 says this, Beloved, let us love one another. 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And on and on we could go. You're here, but are you, are you here in love? See, that's the difference between the law and the spirit. The Pharisees of Paul's day did this very thing. They were meticulous about their obedience, even to the smallest detail of the law. But they would not even show mercy and love toward others. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, you can read about that. And Paul says this in verse 6. Look, he says, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. You know something that I think is so, I, lo I love contrast in scripture. And, and I was noticing the other day that in Exodus, we went through Exodus, I think last year, in Exodus 32, under the law, 3,000 souls were killed. You remember the scene, it was when uh, Moses said, you know, uh, the question was asked, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. Remember? And, and 3,000 people were what? They were killed. God zapped them. Boom, they're dead. Because they didn't go to, the, to that side. They, were, they, they violated the law of God. But then, at Pentecost, Peter said, come to Christ. And 3,000 souls were saved because of the gospel. The law kills. That's what Paul said. The, the law kills, but grace makes alive. Now look again at the text, verse 7 and 8. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on, is, is, it, now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? So the law reveals, but it can't fulfill. The law can reveal, but it can't fulfill. It can only reveal. It's never designed to fulfill any needs. Only grace can fulfill the need for forgiveness. You see, the law is centered around our actions, while grace is centered around the actions of God through his son, Jesus Christ, who died for my sins. You see, the law is sort of like the scales in my bathroom. I have a set of bathroom scales. Anybody got bathroom scales? Any of you get on it and get depressed? Well, I weighed myself this morning and that scale revealed my need. But it was never designed to take away my excess weight. All it could do was reveal my need. That's what the law does. I need another plan for that. Once I start that plan, the scales will only serve to remind me again and again and again that I need a plan. 
The law of God was simply the scales by which God weighed mankind. It could never take away our sins. It could never take the excess weight of our sins away. God's grace became our spiritual weight loss plan where he took away the weight of our sins. You know, the best part of God's plan to get rid of our excess weight of the law in our life and to tone me up with more grace, the best part of it all is that Jesus did all the heavy lifting. Wouldn't you love that? Wouldn't you love it if somebody else could do all the exercise and weight lifting and all you did was get buff? I mean, somebody else does all the work and you just look better and better every day the harder they work. And you're like, go for it, go for it, but you don't have to do anything. That would be fantastic. Well, that's what Jesus did at Calvary. He did all the heavy lifting. He is great. Salvation is by grace alone. The law came in a pretty spectacular way. In Exodus 19, you talk about special effects. I mean, there was thunder and lightning and a dark cloud that covered over Mount Sinai. But just like Labor Day fireworks, the smoke clears, the explosions subside, and everything returns back to the way it was. Now, in verse 9 and 10, look what it says. He says, for if... There was glory in the ministry of condemnation, which was the law. That's what he's talking about there. The ministry of righteousness, which is grace, must far exceed it in glory. And then he says, indeed, this, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. What's he saying here? He's saying that the glories of Calvary far outshine the glories of Sinai. The glories of Mount Calvary, where Jesus was crucified, far outshine the glories of Mount Sinai, where Moses got the law. Grace trumps the law. Look at verse 11. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Now, FYI here, when Paul wrote this letter, the age of law and grace were kind of overlapping a little bit in people's minds. I mean, it wasn't in reality because once Christ died and rose again, we were in the age of grace. Jesus had died and ushered in the new covenant of grace, but the temple services um, were still being carried out with much of the nation of Israel and they were still living under the law and that was a problem and Paul saw that. Change is hard for some folks, even when truth reveals itself through a Savior, and that's what happened. And Paul's adversaries were called Judaizers, so they were trying to meet in the middle, kind of ride the fence, we'll do a little law, we'll do a little grace, kind of like a blended service, I guess. Only theologically wrong. You know, Paul's argument was this. Why do you want to go back to something that was temporary and something that is fading away and leave something that is far more fantastic? Why do you want to do that? You see, the new covenant was getting stronger and stronger and the glory of the law was, was so pre-first century at this point. I mean, it was like it was fading away. Think about it this way in the context of where we are, it, it, to put it in, in what Paul was facing. Nobody, no, nobody goes to the Mac store and asks for a downgrade. You don't go to the Verizon store or the AT&T store and say, hey, uh, I've got this phone here. Could you give me a downgrade? I'd really like to go back to a bag phone, please. Remember the bag phones? People that got those bag phones, they thought they were really something, man. They had a bag phone in their car, and they were like, hmm, you know, really. And now, look at, look at where we are. Nobody ever goes in for a downgrade. If you have a tablet, you're not going to, a digital tablet, you're not going to trade it in for a slate tablet with chalk. I mean, you're not going to trade your car for a horse. You're not going to trade your Maytag for a washboard. 
I used to have a, this old gentleman in, in my church in Covington in the church there. And he, he would go, you know, I hear people all the time talking about, boy, it'd be nice to go back to the 1950s again. He said, not me. I don't want to go back to the 1950s. That was hard. Now, you may still wear a leisure suit, but you don't want to get the wrinkles out of it with a stovetop iron, do you? Nobody looks for a ground day, or downgrade. As believers, we can be changed from glory to glory, the Bible says, according to 2 Corinthians 3.18. Be changed with grace, something that the law could never accomplish. So why would we ever want to bring ourselves back under the, an obsolete system? Try dial 911 on a rotary phone. It's difficult, difficult to do. Pastor Warren Wiersbe said this about the law. He said, the law of Moses is a religion with the most glorious past, but it has no glory today. The light is gone. All that remains are shadows. End of quote. Look again at verse 12 and 13. Again, we're in 2 Corinthians 3. Since we have such a hope... We are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. What's he talking about there? What he's talking about there is when Moses came down from communing with God, if you remember, his face reflected the glory of God to the point that the people could literally see the glory of God on his face and they were impressed by it. They bought into this whole law thing because, I mean, it was, it was all over his face, literally. It was all over his face that this was really something. But Moses knew something about the law. He knew that it was going to fade away. That glory on his face was going to fade away. It's like, a, it's like when you get a, sun, a suntan and then, boy, the winter, you're white as a sheet again. He knew it was going to fade away. And as soon as he finished preaching to the people, he put on a veil. And the veil prevented them from seeing that glory fading away from his face. You see, the law had just been instituted. And the people were not ready to be told uh, that this wonderful system was only temporary. And that it would be uh, coming to an end because that would have discouraged them. Why would it have discouraged them? Because there wasn't a replacement yet. There wasn't grace to replace it. Now, if they had that, that would have been wonderful. But they didn't because God had not revealed the gospel of grace yet. And so Moses put a veil over his face. So Paul was frustrated and heartbroken because the Corinthians, what he said, had a veil over their eyes. Just like Moses had a veil over his face, they could not see the glory of God's grace. Look at verse 14 and 16. He says, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. Now watch. Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Praise the Lord. Paul was sharing the gospel with the Gentiles and they were coming to Christ in droves. But his own people, the Jews, were rejecting grace and returning back to the law and it broke his heart. When people come to Christ today and trust him as Savior, they often tell me, Pastor, the Bible just makes more sense to me now before they couldn't really see it or understand it but now it was penetrating them it was in their heart here's a question has God's grace penetrated more than your intellect are you overcome by grace Are you slain by the rejection of self-righteousness? Or 
Are you one that merely dispenses grace as if it were a piece of candy for someone to enjoy at your bidding? As if you control its supply. See, here's the thing. I do not control the supply of grace in my life. I am arrested by it. I am a prisoner of it. You don't even have to point it out. When grace is seen in your life, it's seen not as you dispense it to others. The reality of it's seen in your actions, in your attitudes. You know, I don't control anything, but God does. And true grace will trump anything that I fear, that you fear. In fact, I want to give you a, a verse on that. First John chapter 4 and verse 18 reminds us, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. What a statement that is. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Where's the grace in our life? You know, grace is the protective finish on my life. Um, when I was pastoring in Kentucky, we had an old chapel. And that chapel was the original church. And um, I mean, from back in the, well, it wasn't the original church. It was, it was one of the, when they really started to, to come together there, it was like back in the 50s, I think it was, that it came there, 40s or 50s. And it was interesting because um, it had this, horrible dilapidated carpet on it and and it didn't originally I mean the carpet itself was 30 some years old but the the chapel was older than that so we were going to renovate the chapel and one of the first things they did is they came in they ripped out all of that old red carpet took all the pews out ripped all of that red carpet out and the most interesting thing um, where all the pews were where the people were where they stood there were bare spots it was almost like it was sanded, the floor was sanded down in the rows where the people had stood over the years. And so they came in and they sanded the floors all down. And they put this beautiful, we wanted, it was maple floors. And, and we, uh, we put this beautiful, beautiful, uh, just clear coat on it. And the most amazing thing, even after they had sanded it, you could still see the worn spots where those people had stood over the years. And it, it was so, it was just really, really, really something to behold. Because grace allows God, it's like a protective coating. It protects and preserves you from the wear and tear in this life. And it can take even those worn spots that you've experienced in your life, the mistakes, the regrets, all of those things, and give them meaning and appeal and preservation for others to see. Look at verse 17 and 18. We're winding this down. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Look, don't, don't feel like you have to be, uh, you got to have it all together now. It's, it's, it's one degree from glory to glory. Every day, God will do something else in your life if you will be willing to let him do it. One degree of glory to, a glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You see, something the law does, the law restricts access to God. When, when, when Moses got the law, Moses was the only one who could go to God. Um, he went to the top of the mountain by himself to receive the law. But under grace and through Jesus Christ... We all may, as the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through a pastor. 
Again, Pastor Wearsby said this, I wrote this down in my notes, legalistic preachers and teachers may get their listeners to conform to some standard, but they can never transform them to be like the Son of God. It's a great reminder for those of us who teach and preach. You can, you can compel your listeners to conform to some standard, but you can never transform them. Only God can do that. Only God's Holy Spirit, only God's Word can do that. So here's my question as we close. Would you be as bold as to pray this week and say, Lord, if there is any veil over my heart where I cannot see the power of grace in my life, would you please remove it? Because grace is not ours to dispense. Grace is just to bowl us over and to wash over us and saturate us as if we've been dunked in a pool of water. And when we have, everybody will see it. You don't have to announce it. They will see it. Father, we thank you. Lord, that um, we can experience grace. Because, Lord, a form of grace is not grace at all. It's just warmed over legalism. And we don't want that in our church or our life. So, Father, help us to understand the power and depth and provision of grace. Grace that comes from you through Jesus Christ, your Son, and a relationship with him. I ask this in Jesus' name. Let me say to you that if you are here and you have never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, oh, I would encourage you to do that tonight. To go to him in prayer and confess to him, admit to him that you are a sinner separated from his grace. And ask him, to forgive you of your sins and by faith trust him that he will remove them and that he will give you eternal life salvation is by grace through faith that not of yourselves it is a gift from God lest any of us can boast I would encourage you to do that and then by all means tell someone that you've done that so that they can encourage you. Amen. Tomorrow. Stand, please. I don't know. I just live.